everyone, welcome. Um, I just wanted to make a quick announcement about live captioning. Um, it's a fairly recent um, accessibility device that we've started offering, or, or it's not a, a device, it's a resource. So if you um, have a phone, a personal device, you can access it by going to pam.2 slash caption. So that's P-A-M dot T-O slash caption. And you can follow along with live captioning to our speaker's um, lecture. And additionally, if you would like any assisted listening devices, we do have them in the back. So that's also a resource that's available. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Dawson Carr, the Janet and Richard Geary Curator of European Art, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's lecture on Georges Delatour's Magdalene with the Smoking Flame, an extraordinary loan from the Los Angeles County Museum of Art for our Masterworks Portland series. As most of you know, this series of exhibitions concentrates on a single outstanding work of art, and Part of uh, it is to allow you to spend time with one work of art in the galleries, and another part is our lecture this afternoon that will uh, take an in-depth look at the painting. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the people whose generosity made the exhibition possible, most especially the European and American Art Council of the Portland Art Museum, Bill and Helen Joe Whitzel, Anne Flowery, uh, Marilyn and Max Pademski in memory of Evelyn Ross, and Depot, as well as the exhibition series sponsors. Our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Lynn Orr, who is the director of the History Museum of Hood River County. Lynn has been there for four years now, and she has greatly enlivened uh, the program of the museum. Um, at the moment, their exhibition is Water Sports in the Gorge that highlights uh, uh, the sports enthusiasts who use the winds and the strong currents of the Columbia for windsurfing, kite surfing, kite boarding, sup, stand up paddle boarding, that is, and now hydrofoiling. It's on through the end of the year. Before Lynn moved to Hood River four years ago for love, um, she was for 30 years the curator of European art for the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. She is a specialist uh, in the art of Caravaggio and his followers. Her dissertation at the University of California, Riverside, a real powerhouse department, uh, was on uh, Caravaggio and the antique. Naturally, uh, we all don't just to get to work in our area of specialization um, in art museums. And she's done a number of really wonderful things over the years, some of which I know you will remember from traveling down to San Francisco to see them. Uh, the Cult of Beauty, the Victorian avant-garde, 1860 to 1900 in 2012. Masters of Venice, Renaissance painters of passion and power, 2011. Um, and, most appositely for our lecture this afternoon, Masters of Light, Dutch painters in Utrecht during the Golden Age back in 1997. I also want to m mention her most recent publication, a really beautiful book, Art Deco, 50 Works of Art You Should Know. It was published by Prestel in 2015. Lynn and I have known each other for more years than we would care to enumerate. Um, she's been a marvelous colleague and friend for a very long time, and it gives me particular uh, pleasure to introduce her to you uh, this afternoon. Will you please join me in welcoming her to the podium? Well, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dawson, for that uh, introduction. We met in 1990, so we've been colleagues and friends for a long time. 
and how exciting to be here to delve into a subject that I love uh, tremendously and that I feel passionately about. And first of all, I just want to tell you how marvelous it is to be a curator, to actually work with works of art and to be able to share what gives us joy, this passion for the real thing, not what you see on your phone or your computer, but standing up really close, as close as the guards will let you, uh, to the pictures themselves, because they have a physical quality to them that they can um, share with you, and that has never been more apparent than in this work by George de la Tour. Um, can we have the light on me down just a little bit because it is washing out the screen? Is that possible, Josh? Yeah, that's, how's that? Is that better for you guys? So um, Dawson has lectured eloquently about this painting by George de la Tour of the Magdalene with the smoking flame and put the painting in context of the artist working at his time. And what Dawson asked me to do is range a little farther. So I'm gonna talk about the iconography of Mary Magdalene, how she came to be perceived as the sinner, the repentant whore, um, and how George de la Tour really imagines her and conveys through his style, his marvelous technique of handling paint and, and glazes to create an image that speaks to us across the ages and across cultures. So here we have this painting and we'll go on immediately and get rid of the text. So you're just looking at the picture itself. And George de la Tour lived in a really tumultuous time. It was a time of the Thirty Years' War between France and um, the Habsburgs in Germany, the in, um, pingement, incringement of um, uh, Spanish Habsburgs as well. And it was also a time of the discovery of many scientific facts and people were beginning to look at the world not just as a reflection of what the Bible said, of what the church said, what the other religions said about the physical world, but really beginning to investigate the physical world for its own sake. And that is really an important quality and movement within the context of 17th century art. George de la Tour also lived at a time when artists were beginning to break out of the idea that they were simply craftsmen. They were artisans controlled by the guilds, like the Saddlers Guild, the Goldsmiths Guild, but that were really creative forces in their own right and worthy of having, for instance, in France in 1648, the French Academy, the Academy of Art of um, Painting and Sculpture was formed. So this is a really interesting time of changes. The Counter-Reformation Catholic Church also is uh, desperately trying to reestablish its control over the European uh, culture and citizens. So many things are going on at this time, and Mary Magdalene is a topic of great interest and fascination, both for people who were preaching, but also for artists. And when you look at this painting called the Magdalene with the smoking flame, and of course these names are names that we have put on them in the 20th century, 19th century, to differentiate this Mary Magdalene from other versions. Um, in the time they were done, they would have just been called Mary Magdalene, pure and simple. But as you look at this image, it is so powerful. And we're gonna talk, I'm gonna talk today about the choices, the stylistic, the compositional choices, the color choices that George de la Tour made, 
uh, as he created his impression, his interpretation of what Mary Magdalene sig signified to him. And as you look at it, you can see that the figure takes up literally half of the composition. And if you've been upstairs to see the picture already, you'll realize this is a relatively large painting. It's about four feet by three feet. She takes up almost half of the composition herself. And then about half of the composition is relatively dark and in shadow. And we are mesmerized by the center of light and luminosity and color intensity by this oil lamp with its flame. Also notice how quiet it is. And that isn't just by chance. And we'll talk a little bit later about the sense of geometry and calm and all of the parallel lines that are emphasized in this picture. She is mesmerized by the unshielded flame, and so are we. And it's only through the most amazing control of composition and color that the artist is really able to draw you into his space as opposed to coming out into our space that was typical of many Baroque artists of the time. George de la Tour must have been captivated by the topic and or he found numerous collectors who were interested in purchasing variations of the topic. There are five autograph versions that are known. These are uh, just a selection. Uh, three variations known from contemporary copies, such as the one here, and then one engraving. So this was a topic that had resonance with his collectors with the time and with the artist himself. So who was Mary Magdalene? This is a really interesting story, and I'm going to go through centuries of scripture, embroideries, changes, uh, uh, conglomerations to create a composite figure that was recognized as being Mary Magdalene in the 17th century. So the first mention in the Bible of Mary Magdalene was in Matthew 27, chapter, ch sorry, chapter 27, verse 56. And the narrator is commenting of, about women gathered at the foot of the cross. And I'm just going to read to you a couple sentences from this verse of Matthew. There were also many women there who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him. Among them, there were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. He goes on a little bit farther in ch chapter 28. Mary Magdalene and the other Marys went to see the sepulcher. So, this is the beginning of the story of Mary Magdalene. Then, one of the next mentions of Mary Magdalene is at the dinner at the house of one of the Pharisees. And so here I show you a painting by Moretto da Brescia. And chapter 7 in Luke says, A woman of the city who was a sinner brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she wept, she wept on his feet. She dampened them with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. And the Pharisee said to someone sitting close to him, if this man was a prophet, he would have known what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And then Jesus talks 
about the repayment and forgiveness of debts. And he likens the forgiveness of a big monetary debt to the forgiveness of a large or significant sin. And Jesus is quoted as saying, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So this is really interesting because nowhere is Mary Magdalene mentioned, but this is one of the images and personalities of Mary Magdalene that become embroidered onto what is actually said about Mary Magdalene in the Bible. And as you can tell from this painting that belongs to the Portland Art Museum, the unguent jar, the ointment jar of the sinner who anointed Jesus' feet at the dinner at the house of the Pharisee became an emblem for Mary Magdalene herself. Another scene that becomes part of the composite personality of Mary Magdalene is Mary and Martha. Sorry. And this is Vermeer's Christ in the House of Mary and Martha. And in Luke, it says, Mary sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. Martha, distracted with much serving, said, in quotations, Lord, do you not care that my sister left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. And Jesus says to Martha, 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 you are anxious and troubled about many things, but only one thing is needful. Mary has chosen the good portion which shall not be taken away from her. And so in this story of Mary and Martha, who are the sisters of Lazarus, you get the idea of Mary and Martha as being the contemplative and the active minds. Both are significant and worthy, but Mary becomes the iconic contemplative person. And this is another time that this story, unrelated to the Magdalene herself, becomes embroidered, added on, to the personality of Mary Magdalene. There's also a long um, descriptions of Mary Magdalene as being at the foot of the cross at the time of Jesus's crucifixion. And in the Bible, it mentions that the women stayed with Jesus where many of his male followers fled obviously in fear of persecution. But Mary is Mary Magdalene then is another character of her personality is that she's steadfast in the face of great danger. And here, these two works are both um, upstairs in the gallery. And you can see how vis vividly uh, colored Mary Magdalene's costume is, that striking green and um, red that beautifully uh, contrasts John's costume in the lower left-hand corner. Now, the personality of Mary Magdalene uh, becomes further uh, enlarged and described. In around 1260, Jacobus de Voragin um, publishes the Golden Legend, Readings on the Saints. And so what we see here is Mary the three Marys going to the tomb of Jesus. And I've selected works from a variety of time periods so that you can see that this is a much loved and recurring um, subject. And I show you uh, this work. 
by Pellegrino de Mariani from the early 1400s. Another topic that is part of the narrative of Mary Magdalene is the nole de tangere, the do not touch me or touch me not, which is that moment after the resurrection, after Mary goes to the tomb. And it's not in every um, gospel that Mary is described as going to the tomb first, but in several she is. But is, is, is in John, chapter 20, where she is described as being bereft that Jesus is not in the tomb. And she cries out, and the angel answers her. And as she, Mary walks away from the tomb, she sees someone who she thinks is a gardener. And he says, what is the matter? Why are you troubled? And she said, they've taken his body away. And he says, Mary, and she recognizes his voice in her name and goes to touch him, and he says, touch me not. One of the great personalities of Mary Magdalene is the fact that she became a penitent um, and a recluse. And there's a wonderful story, again, in the Golden Legend, which are readings of, on the saints, where it's told that Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus and several other feature, per, people are persecuted and put in a boat on the Mediterranean and set adrift in a boat that was unseaworthy by the opponents and persecutors of the Christians. And miraculously, the boat makes it to the coast of France near to Marseille. And there, they disembark. And eventually, Mary goes into solitude and takes up residence in a cave. And she is desirous of contemplation and retirement from the world. And she spends 30 years there. And it's celebrated to this day uh, in the Saint Baume, this beautiful um, cave that she is believed to have taken refuge in. Now, it's interesting, in many of the depictions of Mary Magdalene, she is almost nude or completely nude, covered with hair. And that's one of the characteristics of her stay in this cave. And during this time, supposedly, the angels came and lifted her up into heaven, where she could be fed and nurtured. And I want to show you two uh, early uh, they're wonderful, aren't they? <laughs> so the one on the, uh, the left is from the Nuremberg um, Chronicles. And you see what it says, Mary Magdalene? This um, illuminated manuscript um, illustration represents not Mary Magdalene, but Mary of Egypt. And again, this is another conflation of these different Marys from the original Gospels of the New Testament and also from saints who come after uh, the time of Christ. And I, so I show you this, same type of iconography. And Mary of Egypt was a young woman who uh, sold her body for money. She did a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to a kind of an anti-pilgrimage to confront the Christians there. And she was redeemed by John the Baptist and blessed. And then she took refuge in a cave 
for numerous years and was fed by angels. And so here you can see the iconography of Mary of Egypt becomes adhered to the personality of Mary Magdalene. And I'll just show you one more gorgeous uh, example, this by Philippe de Champagne, very close in date to the works by George de la Tour. Gregory the Great was Pope, as you can see, from 590 to 604, and he wrote extensively on Mary Magdalene. And we can thank Gregory for cementing this conflation of personalities in the figure of the biblical Mary. He relates her sins to the fact she's a woman, her sexuality, tempting man, tempting members of the clergy. And he writes a, a homily in 591 AD talking about Mary. And he says the seven sins that were cast out of her were the seven deadly sins. And he goes on at length talking very sensually about the fact she kissed his feet, she rubbed oil, oil that she had used on her own body. And so it's a very curious uh, description of this person. And subsequent authors have written that this was a celibate's view written for a celibate clergy. Um, and we have to realize that there was, this was a moment in the church where the church was really working hard to cement its hierarchy, to cement its position in the world of religions, to adopt something of um, the patriarchal structure of Judaism. And so there were many reasons that it was thought proper, necessary for the survival of the um, administration of the church to keep women in subservient roles, to view, to prosper and to grow. It was thought that all male church hierarchy was required to administrate the growing organization itself, to administer the sacraments, and to preach amongst the people and the believers. So this lower status for women is something that we read in much of the um, literature of the time, but it wasn't, not surprisingly, ed, um, embraced by everyone. And I want to um, just bring in uh, Christine de Pizan. She was an Italian woman who was uh, moved by her family to Paris when she was just a child. And she became one of the first humanist feminists. And she was one of the first women that we know of who made a living on her writing skills. And she wrote a number of books and texts and one of them is the book of the city of the ladies. And you can see here, it's very beautifully illustrated. So she had illuminators and painters and scribes work with her. 30 copies of this uh, text are known today. And I show you illustrations from a copy that belonged to Jean de Berry the Duke of Burgundy, and this book was um, published in 1405. And what it is, it's a conversation between Christine and reason and justice and rectitude. And these three spirits say to her, build a city for famous women, for virtuous women, and that is what this book is about. 
and here you can see them building the town. And here you can see it says this book belongs to the Duke de Berry. And look at one of the other illustrations. Who's being welcomed into this human-made uh, town but the Virgin Mary herself and who is accompanying her with her jar of ointment but the Mary Magdalene. So these stories were a rich source of creativity in literature and in art as well. And oh, here's a, a better detail. And here is the Magdalene. Closer to uh, George de la Tour's time, there was another great discussion about who Mary Magdalene actually was. And Jacques Lefebvre de Taples was a cleric, a writer, and an important philosopher. And he got drawn into a conversation and a controversy about the identity of Mary Magdalene around 1510 to 1518. And he had taught at the University of Padua. He had traveled widely. He was a correspondent of um, Marcio Ficino, Giovanni Piccolo da Mirandola. These are great names in humanist learning. And as I said, as part of the debate was, who was Mary Magdalene actually? And in this project, Lefebvre was going to go back and look at the actual texts of the Bible itself. And again, in the spirit of scientific investigation, humanist learning, and not accepting everything that you have been taught, but going back and studying it, he becomes embroiled in the discussion of who Mary Magdalene was. And what did the Bible actually say? And this was, this whole conversation was prompted by the visit of the French queen mother, Louis de Savoy, um, to saint Baume, you know, the holy cave where Mary Magdalene supposedly spent 30 years uh, close to Marseille. And that was in 1516. And she asked her advisor, please, you know, write, write, write something on the life of Mary Magdalene. And her advisor was Francois de Moulin, who actually had been one of Lefebvre's students. And what they set out to do was examine critically the gospel narratives and any spurious traditions. And Francois de Moulin realized, oh, this doesn't look very good for the true identity of Mary Magdalene. So he called Lefebvre, or he sent uh, correspondence to Lefebvre and said, please, um, help. And so Lefebvre took it on, and he disassembled Mary Magdalene down to the original citations in the Gospels. And not surprisingly, he was censored for that. And he was told by the papacy in 1519, you must not discuss this any further. But there were people um, across Europe that got involved in this conversation. Uh, from Metz, from John Fisher, even the chancellor of Cambridge, and so these people began to realize there's something wrong here. But in the wake and the tumult of the uh, Re Reformation, sorry, the Counter-Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, these ideas were uh, put aside as being dangerous to the faith of the people in the Catholic, in the Christian church. So it was really not until, uh, or in 1627, another treatise on Mary Magdalene was published. 
and that was by Cardinal Pierre de Brule, um, Bay Brule, sorry, and he talks more about Mary Magdalene as being the great symbol of penance, of contemplation, and this resonated with the counter-reformation of the Catholic Church, because you may remember in opposition to the Reformation, the Catholic Church really bore down on the ideas of the sacraments, of the cult of the saints. And Mary Magdalene being a symbol of penance, one of the great sacraments, was really seen to be an important element in this counter-reformation doctrine. I just want to show you here, though, the frontispiece of uh, Beyrule's uh, treatise on Mary Magdalene shows her as a penitent with the unguent jar, the skull, the cross. So these are symbols that we have begun to recognize. So Mary Magdalene's composite personality really main, remains intact for the wider Catholic Church and for the parishioners. However, sorry, an unusual series of modern events have really made Mary Magdalene the subject of extensive discussion and erudition. In 1896, a book, an apocryphal book on papyrus was purchased in Cairo, given the name, The Gospel of Mary. And this is a gospel, not one of this, the codified, sanctioned uh, gospels in the New Testament of M Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but gospel in the sense that it's an ancient text that talks about the life and teachings of Jesus. And it was written in a Coptic dialect. And in 1938, it was published um, in a modern um, edition, and I just show you um, one of the pages from this, and then a modern book that uh, recreates and republishes the entire surviving gospel. But then, in 1949, a cache of codices, papyrus codices was discovered in Nag Hammadi, Egypt. And I show you a map there of where it was. There were 52 different treatises in 13 leather-bound uh, papyrus codices. They had been uh, sealed in a jar and discovered then in 1945. And bit by bit, they reached out into the world of book collectors and museums. One of the treatises published in it was Plato's Republic. So this was a compendium of different types of uh, information and early uh, treatises on the world. And one of them was another imperfect, partial copy of the Gospel of Mary. And so what that did, it, it, it validated the authenticity of the first fragments that had been found and uh, come to market in 1896. And these are thought to be Gnostic texts, that's G-N-O-S-T-I-C. And Gnosticism was the great variety of beliefs that were held by the various communities across uh, the ancient world, systems of different, different interpretations of Jewish, uh, Christian, and other teachings of the first and second centuries. 
Scholars in general disagree which Mary that the Gospel of Mary was talking about. But because it mentions the fact that she was the, the Mary was the first witness of the risen Jesus, many people believe it is the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. And so this is further emphasis on the importance of Mary in the followers of Jesus. And she was given the title of the apostle to the apostles because in the garden, Jesus had said, go and tell the others that I have risen. And so that gives Mary uh, a very high ranking amongst the, the closest intimates of Christ. And we also have to realize that in the early years of the Christian faith, there were not printed books. There were few manuscripts where the texts were written down. They were very expensive, very um, arduous to make. Most people did not read or even have access to these few texts. So the um, teachings were different, slightly different variations in different communities because different people were um, speaking these traditions. And as you know from the, the theme of the phone conversation, ideas change subtly um, or importantly, as ideas are exchanged from one person to the next. Interest, another interesting thing is that in 1969, the papacy submitted to the Catholic Church a document that said, we have gone back and examined the Bible, and we have cleared up some misconceptions. And one of the misconceptions was about the identity of Mary Magdalene. And so quietly, she was redefined. And her feast day was demoted from a duplex, which is like the most elaborate celebration within the Catholic Catholic ceremonies, um, and she just became a personality. But I should tell you, in 2016, Pope Francis reestablished her ceremony as a duplex, as one of the uh, most favored and premier saints among the, Chris the Christian Catholic Church. In the late 20th century and in the beginning of the 21st century, there has been huge amount of conversation and writings about Mary Magdalene and her role in the church. And she became a symbol of women's status. And I don't mean and don't want here to refight, litigate, or um, settle the issue of the universal tension between women and men, between the male and female experience. But I think we can all um, uh, agree and acknowledge that these tensions do exist and are a universal, recurring, omnipresent issue of human society. I personally believe in the concept of yin and yang with mutually complementary reliance. So how does all this relate to George de la Tour? Now we get down to it. Um, so here's our painting again. Marvelous, draws you in, it's magnetic, it's quiet, it's forceful. And it is so much a unique piece of art. Here I show you a map of France. And so it shows, here's Lorraine, 
And you can see it has all of these uh, different countries, peoples around it. And here is Nancy, and there's Met. And here is a close-up from about 16, uh, 1600. And here is Vic sur Say, where George de la Tour was born. Here's Looneyville, where his wife's family was from, where he moved. And then uh, Nancy is here. So you have this triangle. And then Metz, Verdun, and Toul were the archbishoprics of the, um, of the area. And so this was a very complicated uh, center politically and religiously. Here is a drawing, very beautiful, by Israel Sylvest of the town of Vic and um, Vic Circe. And you can see it's a very beautiful um, town, many church spires, not surprisingly. And so this is where George de la Tour was born. He worked in Vic. He established his studio in 1620. And then, uh, just prior to that, in 1617, he had married Diane Dion Leneuf, who was a member of a wealthy family in Luneville. And everything is complicated and interesting because there were many artists of this time from Vic, from Luneville, from Nancy, and George de la Tour was surely apprenticed to one of them. Um, one of the great questions about Do George de la Tour's career is whether or not he went to Italy, which so many artists from this region went. And scholars have spent a lot of time um, supporting it or rejecting this idea. There's no documentation of George de la Tour in Italy, but his art really reflects the art of Caravaggio and other artists who had been to Rome to see the art of Caravaggio and then had filtered back to their homes in Northern Europe. But there were so many examples of the Caravaggesque style that it's not necessary that George de la Tour himself went to, uh, to Italy to see the innovations, which by 1630 were beginning to become old fashioned themselves because Caravaggio was active in Rome around 1600 to about 1605. Um, George de la Tour established a number of important wealthy patrons and connections. Uh, surely significant was the fact that in 1632, the French king Louis XIII stayed in um, Vic with another painter who George de la Tour surely knew uh, for several weeks. And surely George de la Tour would have met him there or later, when uh, George de la Tour traveled to Paris and became a painter supplying painters to Cardinal Richelieu. By 1639, George de la Tour was using the title painter in ordinary to the king, meaning that he had the support and patronage of Louis XIII. In 1639, um, oh, let me just show you. He also um, worked in Nancy. And here is a wonderful print of the Ducal Palace in Nancy. And I also want to show you um, a, let me go to this one first. This is another Sylvester work. This is as you can see, a large engraving of the city of Nancy. And I'm gonna go back to this detail, even though it's a little um, fuzzy, 
and hard to read because the spires are all numbered in this print. And in this list, I hope you can make out the name of countless religious um, institutions. There um, were many uh, groups, religious groups throughout Nancy, Lunéville, throughout Lorraine and France that supported women. There were many different orders of penitent men, penitent women, uh, groups that supported uh, fallen women, uh, prostitutes, and not su surprisingly, they might adopt the name and protection of Mary Magdalene. So as I have said, Lorraine was in between these much larger powers. And the King of France wanted to control Lorraine in order to keep the troops coming from what we now call Germany out of French ter territory. And so there were a series of years um, when there were tremendous battles and destruction and pillage throughout Lorraine. And one of the great artists of the area, Jacques Callot, who lived in Nancy, who had been to Italy and established his profession and uh, honed his artistry, was asked to do uh, paintings and prints. He was primarily a printmaker uh, of what was happening in Lorraine. And he created a series called The Miseries and Misfortunes of War. And I show you um, just one of the details. Now Jacques Cal um, Callot is a, an interesting character in our story. As I mentioned, he uh, was from this region, went to Italy, and then returned. And he was a printmaker, an etcher, and I show you this because it shows the sale of prints, small diminutive prints that he was famous for in addition to his more historical looks at contemporary uh, society. And here are two small prints that represent the Magdalene. He also did prints that represent beggars and poor people. And I show you this uh, pair from 1622 because I couldn't help but throw in the two paintings from the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco of um, an old man and an old woman. And they are really believed to be personifications of characters from the um, French uh, comedic stage, and you can just uh, see the old man kind of as um, this woman uh, shouts invectives uh, his direction. But this, um, this detail also gives you a good sense of the surface of the paintings. And uh, not wanting to leave out another George de la Tour candidate on the West Coast, I show you uh, in the Seattle Art Museum is a painting attributed to George de la Tour of Saint Sebastian tended by Saint Irene, Irene, and here is a detail of it. And it is thought to be by a close um, follower, but not actually by the artist himself. But it's uh, marvelous to go from a painting like the LA County Museum and then go to Seattle and see the other picture so you can compare in your mind the strengths and weaknesses of each one. So George de la Tour's marvelous painting of the Magdalene is this powerful picture. Its composition is controlled and geometric almost. And this gives it a solidity and a grandeur, a classical uh, gravity that is really important for his subject matter. I, I just wanted to show it in comparison with another a closely dated work. Uh, I could have chosen any of dozens, if not hundreds, of examples. But I chose this one by Guido Reni 
of um, about 1628 to show you, I think this really underscores the difference between the, the uh, two interpretations of the Magdalene and how the use of color and line and lighting can really determine how you, the viewer, appreciate and experience the work. Uh, this is a beautiful picture, but when you look at her almost quizzical look, the flowing hair, the kind of rhythmic um, undulation of drapery and hair, it has a totally different mood from the George de la Tour. Here, everything is quiet. Everything is controlled. And that is part of its strength. And then the color itself, it's sonorous and rich, but quiet. Um, it isn't bold in any way. And here's a, a picture, uh, again, thought to be a copy, uh, but this time of Caravaggio of Mary Magdalene in ecstasy. And I wanted to compare again, the two interpretations. And I think you can see, without me belaboring the fact, how all of these stylistic choices made very consciously by the artist affect the way you experience the work. And the, this Caravaggio seems so much more um, dramatic and emotional, even though um, the woman isn't... Um, engaged in any movement or voicing any expression at all. Another work by George de la Tour um, is the Penitent Magdalene of about 1640, and it has a very beautiful uh, mirror in it. But the beauty of the mirror and the reflections, to my mind, detracts from the Magdalene herself. And when you look again closely at George de la Tour's, how restrained it is. And notice how her head is turned a little bit inward, away from you, the viewer. Um, and then that very gorgeous single strand of hair um, on the bare shoulder suggests only barely the sensuality of the classic interpretation, the classic personification of Mary Magdalene as a prostitute. And I just um, want to spend a, a couple more minutes um, on uh, the picture itself. And I want you to just delve into this marvelous detail. And I think um, candle versus oil light allows the artist to do something much more interesting, much more complex, and much more difficult. And then you have the still life of books. And remember, printing had come along. And so books now were much more available. And also, to have the Magdalene in conjunction with the books, it suggests a, a depth of understanding and an intellect. And how almost surreptitiously the crucifix, the cross, is there on the table. And um, the whip to flagellate herself, but very understated. This is a moment when books become the subject of still life paintings and are the symbol, obviously, of learning and the dissemination, not only of contemporary learning, but of the classics as well. I think that this picture, in its realism, really reflects a lot that's going on at the time. And I'm not suggesting that George de la Tour knew about everything that was going around, um, going on in the arts, letters, and science of his time. But he did have contact with an important collector named Alphonse de Rambervillier. Um, and Ram, sorry, Rambervillier um, had actually been a witness at George de la Tour's wedding. So we know there was contact. And this was a person who lived in Vic, who was an accomplished um, amateur uh, writer. 
He was a great collector of books, of manuscripts, and he had a cabinet of curiosities. And that would have contained any number of things, rocks, telescopes, um, all kinds of wonderful, exotic, and scientific things. This is the moment across Europe when the telescope is turned on the stars. And then, this is Galileo's um, great phases of the moon of 1609 um, uh, uh, painting. And then also, the telescope is flipped around and used as a microscope. And you have this marvelous um, publication by Hooke and has uh, just one of the most wonderful images in the natural philosophy of the time of this flea. And um, in Dawson's lecture, he um, did this detail showing a fly sitting on the hurdy-gurdy's um, uh, uh, book next to him. And then also this depiction of a dog. So again, Artists as well as natural philosophers are looking into the world very closely for its own sake, not for its religious symbolism or associations, but for the beauty, the um, intensity, the intricacy of nature. And one of the um, theses that came out about this time was on the laws of refraction. However, this law had been discussed in 1610 by a Dutch uh, natural philosopher called Snell. And so I, I can see all of these things coming together in the acute realism of the picture of, of Mary Magdalene. And again, look, look at the complexity and the challenge of representing the light going into that uh, glass vessel and being bounced around, uh, very beautifully described. Uh, one more example that I want to share with you is this painting by George de la Tour of a newborn child um, about 1640. And let me mention that in 1636, George de la Tour's 10th child was born, and her name was Marie, so Mary. But I want to show you this um, detail, because this is one of the first times in the history of art where the newborn child is created, represented, treated realistically. And if you just look at the quality of her skin, or his skin could be the, um, you know, the infant Jesus. This is a, seems like a secular subject that can have also a religious interpretation. But look at the sheen and the color, and that, to my eye, and I shared it with one of my friends who is a a, um, a medical doctor. To my eye, represents the vernix. Uh, Cassiosa, I think you pronounce it, which is a material that is generated on the unborn child's skin before it enters the world of the living, of oxygen and a new dry atmosphere. And it is specifically uh, engineered in the body to protect uh, the newborn child. So in all these many ways then, we see that George de la Tour uses the elements of style to heighten the believability, the message, the um, persuasive quality of his paintings. And in the Mary Magdalene, this icon of penance you see her meditating and really reaching for an internal experience, focusing on the flame that suggests the um, spirit of the human soul and on the smoke 
that ascends as if to God, to heaven, and to redemption. How deftly he handles the paint, the composition, the lighting, uh, the color to draw you in and for you to experience the quietude and the beauty of the realistic world combined with the religious experience. So thank you. So are there um, any questions? And if I don't know the answer, somebody in the audience can Google the answer. <laughs> we Hello. have microphones yes. on the sides, so we'll pass them out. We have a question over here. I beg your pardon? The history of the painting and the reason of why they put a skull on the Oh, I, yes, of course. I should have mentioned that. The skull is, she's meditating on death. So the idea that human life is all in vain, that everybody dies, um, that idea of vanity and salvation through penance and gaining forgiveness through the church? Oh, the painting um, only came to light in the 1970s and then entered the collection of the LA County Museum. So it doesn't have a long provenance. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, did Latour and other painters of the period create this kind of work with models with 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 uh... yes quite frequently and if you look through the body of George de la Tour's work you can say see the same figures the same same faces faces returning again and again so yes very much and and uh, this a model with a very plain or plainer face, oval face, uh, with these specific eyes and the profile of the nose you see again and again throughout his work. So yes, Thank these you. artists had special models that they loved. We have a question here. Uh, you know, looking at the painting, I can't help to think how much of the painting uh, her feet and her legs are, and they look in a really relaxed state, if I'm seeing it correctly, yet you have the flagellation device. So I'm wondering if he was portraying the realization, like she's got it. Like she's what? She's got it. Like she's at the end of her contemplative life about who Christ was in her life. I mean, why, why, why do you think the legs take up so much of the painting? Like, um, what's he trying to tell us there? Um, what is he trying to tell us there? I think he's occupying uh, that area of the canvas. Again, everything's very still, very regularized. Um, these lines are only just um, suggested. Um, and then these block-like figures. Uh, so he's populating uh, his canvas but uh, leaving the central part as the focus of attention um, and the symbolic meaning of the picture. Thank you. I know um, one thing I, I didn't mention, and that, again, is the miraculous treatment of light. And if you look at the way the light comes through the material, um, it isn't just the way the light uh, bounces around and illuminates the oil, but uh, the way it uh, falls through the different materials as well as onto the different materials. So, we have a question here. It's kind of a question comment. Um, in the earlier paintings, they always show her with her vessel of oil. Is it possible that where the flame is is representative? of that vessel of oil because it doesn't seem to appear any place else in the painting. And the flame coming from that vessel seems symbolic of something. Um, that's a very interesting point that I hadn't um, thought about. 
I was looking at it more as an actual uh, source of light, um, but wonderful observation. And that's one of the great things about art is we all get something from it and can add to uh, the body of knowledge about a work of art. So, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it.